Ladies and gentlemen, dear panelists, uh, welcome here to this uh, session in the International Convention Center here in Sharm el Sheikh, Egypt, to discuss a topic that is crucial for the contribution to the global climate objectives, namely the role of transport infrastructure. And before starting, I would like to remind that this is a silent conference, so you can please use your headphones for the very good understanding of the whole session, if you wish. Uh, and I also would like to welcome, of course, those who are attending online with us here in Sharm el Sheikh uh, today. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Harald Reuters and I'm a director in DG MOVE, uh, dealing with investments in innovative and sustainable transport. And uh, I'm very happy to be the moderator of the debate here today. We will tackle many questions here today that are key for the decarbonization of the transport sector. Like how can transport infrastructure effectively contribute to cutting the greenhouse gas emissions? How can we adapt it to the challenges of the climate change and increase the resilience of transport infrastructure? And what is the role of funding in developing green and resilient transport infrastructure? And how can we best mobilize the resources that need to be available? So these are a few of the very pressing aspects that we would like to address here today. It's an EU organized event and so we'll start the session with a short overview of what the EU is doing in building the Trans-European Transport Network. And then thereafter we will approach the topic also through a global lens with the help of four panelists. I'm very happy to have three inspiring speakers here today that will help us to understand and shed light on the many different aspects of our discussion. First of all, Mrs. Regina Azarotis from UNCTAD, which will provide us with the global perspective with a focus on adaptation. Then Matej Sakonjek from the Transport Community Secretariat, responsible for this policy in the Western Balkans that will bring us back to Europe, elaborating on the role of a predefined multimodal corridors and policy reforms, key to the sustainable transport in the Western Balkans. And Mr. Benjam Reja from the World Bank, which will tell us about how innovative financing instruments and approaches can promote green connectivity in low and middle income countries. So then we will have a debate with the speakers, first of all, giving them an opportunity to elaborate a bit further on their ideas and to provide us with some more insights. And then I will turn to you here in the room and also the audience online that can question uh, us here in the panel on the perspectives that you have and any other questions that you may have. So first of all, I would like to briefly turn to the EU experience and the 10T network, as it is called, and the efforts that the Union is making on cutting transport emissions also through transport infrastructure, which is not self-standing as one often thinks of very inter, uh, it's disruptive infrastructure projects. So let's have a look uh, here at this 10T policy. This policy, which is now 30 years old, is paving the way also to become climate neutral and climate resilience by 2050. And our sustainable and smart mobility strategy has translated these objectives of the Green Deal into a number of proposals that you know as Fit for 55 with AFIR and Fuel EU and Refuel EU, Maritime and Air. And also then in a set second package, TENTI, ITS and other uh, proposals that we made. And you see on the slide here the corridors of the Trans-European network depicted uh, quite colorfully across the Union, which should help us to reduce by 90% until 2050 or emissions. And ladies and gentlemen, we do that in a stepped approach. We have, of course, a network that will allow us to have first these nine corridors in the core network to be realized by 2030 and then a more comprehensive network to be realized by 2050. And this layered approach should allow us then to become really a sustainable transport policy uh, in total. And we have been proposing a new, uh, a new regulation in December 21 that is putting the ambition in line with the Green Deal, with higher requirements, and with very, uh, I would say, targeted objectives for all of the transport modes to decarbonize. Of course, we needed to take into account the effects that were uh, geopolitically uh, very clear after the 24th of February of this year, with the Russian 
unjustified war of aggression against Ukraine. And you can see on this map also that we have been extending four of the corridors into Ukraine and Moldova in order to reflect this new geopolitical situation. So how can we uh, look into achieving these goals? In the beginning, what is absolutely necessary is that we reinforce the standards and the requirements so that we have a real fully-fledged transport network of high standard all across the core and the comprehensive network. And we want, of course, to increase thereby the possibility to use the most sustainable transport uh, modes and we would in particular also try to have a more multimodal and interoperable network. Very often the connections in the ports, in the airports and in the urban nodes are missing to have that possibility to use the environmentally friendly modes which are of course rail, which is decarbonized to a large extent, 80% of all the services are on electrified rail but also connecting them in the nodes to short sea shipping, to inland waterways, which are the transport modes that are really environmentally friendly and that we can be using today. But of course, beyond that as well, we have to decarbonize each of the transport modes. And we do that, of course, also with very clear objectives for alternative fuels, where we are going into great length and details on how they can contribute to also all the other modes being environmentally friendly and making sure that we have the alternative fuel deployment along the network. In order to do so, we have of course to be very careful that we have also the funding available, the funding which allows uh, to uh, have the rollout in particular of cross-border and bottlenecks that are missing. Connecting Europe facility is the main instrument, but we have also a number of other instruments like the RRF and the Cohesion Fund. And we work, of course, also with the uh, innovative, or sorry, the international financial institutions that are contributing through, for instance, InvestEU and other schemes that are available. Of course, we are also reaching out beyond the Union. You saw on the map, I will click back, uh, reaching out through the Western Balkans through the Eastern Partnership, also to the uh, Norway and uh, Switzerland, which are extending the 10T beyond. And we are also doing that politically speaking, and uh, for sure we will have uh, quite a few words on that in the panel afterwards. One of the instruments that are looking also more globally is the Global Gateway project that was launched last year where we are trying to promote the policies of sustainable, smart and resilient networks also across all continents and for all modes of transport. I have given you a very brief overview of this TENTI policy and the way we are reaching out uh, and the way we are trying to implement this by 2030, 2040 and 2050 in three steps. Uh, and now I would uh, turn, of course, to uh, my panel in order to have their uh, contributions. So first of all, I would like to introduce uh, Regina Azariotis from UNCTAD to take the floor and give us a global perspective, uh, Regina, on the role of transport infrastructure with a clear focus on climate adaptation and resilience. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you very much for inviting me to this panel. Uh, one of the key elements of the proposed uh, revision of the 10T regulation is climate resilience and adaptation for international transport networks and nodes. That's an issue we've been working on for many years, starting in uh, 2008. So I'm going to take this opportunity to share some observations from a global perspective to highlight why all of this matters and what's of particular interest in considering the EU's approach. Uh, if I may, I'd like to start with just saying that transport is not just an important industrial sector, but is a critical enabler of global trade and sustainable development. International transport networks and nodes provide the physical infrastructure uh, on which our globalized trading system depends. To illustrate the point, over 80% of global merchandise trade is carried by sea from port to port, and around 60% of seaborne trade is loaded and uh, unloaded in developing countries. And globalization means we're all very deeply interconnected and interdependent, so there is no them and us. But these 
critical infrastructure assets, they are at considerable and a growing risk of climate change impacts. And that includes rising mean and extreme sea levels and extreme weather, which can result in significant damage, but also costly disruptions and delay across supply chains with potentially far-reaching implications for international trade and for the sustainable development prospects of those most vulnerable. And when we're talking about risk in the present context, we need to understand that risk is a function of hazard, exposure, and vulnerability. If hazards are, are growing, then we must reduce our vulnerability, which means, which means we need to take measures to adapt. And the hazards are growing, all of them. But particularly important in the present context would be extreme sea levels, in my example, which cause coastal flooding um, and are a particular threat to ports and other critical coastal transport infrastructure because, of course, ports are connected to uh, networks. We did some research some time ago with the Joint Research Center of the European Commission on projected changes in the return period of extreme events, the one in 100 year extreme sea level event for about 3,700 ports. And we found that even at 1.5 degrees, which is expected as soon as in the 2030s, many ports in subtropical and tropical areas would experience an extreme sea level event of this magnitude, what used to be once in a century, every one to two to 10 years. And at three degrees, many global ports would experience an event of this magnitude several times uh, per year. Now, economic losses from coastal flooding can be extensive, both in terms of infrastructure damage, but also, and maybe more importantly, in terms of operational disruptions and delays, which uh, have important knock-on effects throughout global supply chains. To give you a few examples only, because I have limited time, but losses in the Caribbean hurricane season in 2017 amounted to a multiple of the GDP of several of the Caribbean nations. And Hurricane Sandy in 2012 hitting New York City caused over 60 billion US dollars in damages, including a week-long shutdown of one of the major US ports in that area. And recent research suggests that by 2100, the total value of assets exposed to episodic coastal flooding could increase to 12 to 20 percent of the global GDP if no adaptation measures are taken. So if you look at what's at stake and effectively the cost of inaction and also consider infrastructure lifespans which are very long and mm. worsening climate projections, then it's very clear that climate resilience and adaptation for seaports and other critical transport infrastructure is a matter of strategic economic importance. And this is particularly the case for vulnerable uh, coastal developing countries and, for example, sea-locked countries like the small island developing states, which depend on their ports as veritable lifelines for external trade, food and energy security, and tourism, and also in the context of disaster risk reduction and response. For these countries, capacity building and major scaling up on investment and adaptation will be critical. And to increase levels of preparedness and help mitigate impacts, upscaling of early warning systems is also going to be very important. And in this context, I think it's worth mentioning the uh, launch here at the COP of the early warning for all by the WMO. And also there's some uh, EU-funded research actually ongoing to develop an early warning system for coastal flooding across EU coastlines called ECFAS. And that's a very good idea, which hopefully will be uh, making school. Effective adaptation requires multifaceted approaches, and that includes, of course, innovative technical measures. But to be fit for purpose and also to avoid maladaptation, these need to be based on evidence-based risk and vulnerability assessments at facility level. This is increasingly being recognized, but the big question is how to get there, how to translate ambition into action on the ground. And policy and legal frameworks play an important role in this context by creating a playing, level playing field and by galvanizing effective action on the ground. And the proposed revision of the 10T regulations makes an important contribution in this respect. Why? It does so by requiring climate proofing 
of new infrastructure on the network in accordance with detailed technical guidance to make risk and vulnerability assessment and development of adaptation options an integral part of project planning, development and financing. And I think uh, I've come to the end of my time, but maybe we have a, an opportunity to talk a bit later about this some more. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Regina. Uh, that was very insightful, and uh, in particular the figures that you were quoting on the floodings and the ports that will be uh, certainly animating a bit of the debate. I, I myself, Regina, quote from time to time the figure cost of the floodings that we had in Belgium and Germany uh, last year, which was 41 billion. Uh, which is about uh, almost two times the SAF budget that I have available, which was just gone in one night of flooding. And this is happening more and more often, so we have to be prepared for that. So I'm very happy that you focused on this climate adaptation and uh, resilience. We'll come back to you in, in questions. I then turn uh, to Matej Sekonczek. Uh, Matej, you will uh, focus on this role of predefined multimodal corridors and also policy reforms. You are the director of the transport uh, community, uh, which is the organization that uh, deals with transport and mobility in the Western Balkans, uh, but you are also expanding your role now, so you'll certainly say a word on that. Please, Matej. Thank you very much. Uh, just maybe a clicker. There is here. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Um, thank you very much and thank you for uh, inviting me. Uh, indeed, uh, we are bringing together 36 participants now, so the entire EU, the Western Balkans, and now three observers from Moldova, Ukraine and Georgia with one aim, and that aim is the integration of the Western Balkans transport markets into the EU. Now, how we are achieving that? We are achieving that by working on the two parallel tracks. On one hand, uh, we are helping the partners to adopt and implement entire EU legislation when it comes to transport. That is important because that also means the highest environmental standards when it comes to how transport is organized. So that is a very crucial part, so the reforms part. And the second part is indeed the projects, which are the main projects on the main TENTI corridors. And here I think that, um, so it's both how things are done in transport and also where they are done in transport. This always needs to be planned together because we see what happens if only the projects are promoted, but the policy reforms are not following. And this is really a big challenge, and this is something that we want to address. Now, when it's a question, where do we focus our attention, is specifically on the TENT corridors, on the TENT network. That will show you on the first page, you can see that this is the connection of the rail as well as the road in the Western Balkans, and right away, one thing which is very crucial is you see that this is truly a network. A network that connects the ports, airports, main cities, main uh, centers of economy where people live. And this is the basis if we would like to have sustainable transport, we need to have sustainable network which is connecting different modes of transport. And here I would like to specifically focus on one which is rail. Rail is the backbone of all network connectivity because it's the only and the most efficient connection between different transport modes that we have specifically on the rivers or in the ports. Now, the network here in the Western Balkans connects, of course, to the EU. Not only that, it connects the EU. So basically, you can see that connections that are going through the Western Balkans are also connecting Europe. And that is also, of course, in this slide. Now, when we talk about connectivity in the Western Balkans and importance for sustainability of it, I really see the networks as the key, both in sustainability in a classical terms of economic sustainability, um, social sustainability, and environmental. Why, first of all, uh, uh, fiscal, so economic sustainability? Because the networks means that the administrations need to focus on priorities. They need to focus their finances, they need to focus their finances on the projects which are in interest of the entire region. And this is money well spent. It is also a much higher oversight of how the money is spent. And of course, this boosts the economic cooperation between them and with the EU. On the social sustainability, it brings together people, it brings to together friends, it's being, it brings together neighbors. And that is the basic element for a good neighborly relations and hopefully the lasting peace in our region, which have seen a lot of troubles in the decades uh, before. 
and, of course, specifically environmental sustainability. Here, the focus is on multimodality. And if you see again the region, basically from each major city that you go in the region is less or equal to 500 kilometers. 500 kilometers should be a climate neutral travel in the coming decades. And there is only the rail that can deliver that and of course the inland waterways. And that's why this is very much, we believe that the future in that respect definitely is on tracks. And now my final slide will just show you how does, well, it's great because on the slide perhaps the entire world disappeared due to the color <laughs> scheme, but you get the, you get the idea. Let's see it, let's see it. Ah, here you see it better. Okay, very good. So, why is this the crucial also for the world? Because once the ships pass Suez Canal, which means the entire trade that is coming from Asia and from the Middle East, they need to decide to which port of Europe they will go in order that then to come to the different markets. If we have sustainable connections via Western Balkans, a good rail connections, if we also decrease waiting times at the borders, and that is, I think, something that is also shared by the countries outside the EU, the problems on the border crossings, then the connection via the Western Balkans, connection via this route can be the shortest and can actually cut the sailing time by sometimes 14 days. So that's why these connections are not crucial only for the Western Balkans, only for Europe, but also for the world. Thank you. Matej, thank you very much. Thank you for uh, putting the Western Balkans in this uh, global map and for uh, also uh, linking thereby between uh, the different uh, levels that we are discussing. I, I liked also the fact that you said that the network, uh, you showed also the detailed maps, the network is providing uh, also a resilience, in fact because if each of the six uh, Western Balkans would be individually looking at their own network, if there would be an event happening like Regina was saying, then the resilience would be relatively low and streams would be cut, like you were also discussing, uh, Regina, very, very easily. So th thank you for doing so. We'll come back with a few questions uh, uh, to you as well. Uh, I now would like to turn to our last speaker, uh, Mr. Binyam Reja. Uh, who will bring some crucial elements of funding into our discussion because, of course, this is very nice to see, but how are we going to realize that? And you will focus in particular on innovative financing approaches, uh, Benjam, to see how we can promote green connectivity in the low- and middle-income countries. You are the Global Practice Manager for Transport and Infrastructure of Vice Presidency of the World Bank. floor is yours. Benjam, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, for, first of all, for the opportunity to be here and to discuss uh, this important topic. Um, in the World Bank, uh, we've had a very good uh, collaboration, actually, with the European Commission. Uh, we, a couple of years ago, we did a study on the expansion of the TNT corridor uh, to the Eastern Partnership. So uh, maybe i say a little bit uh, of what... Uh, the lessons are from there for us, what uh, we, we came out of those. So this was about greening the connectivity and green connectivity to the Eastern Partnership that we did. So in that regard, uh, what we saw is if uh, the Eastern Partnership countries were to implement what was recommended on that uh, study, uh, they would reduce the greenhouse gas emission by more than uh, 50%. Yes, it's lower than the 90% the EU has a, as a target, but this was basically a constrained optimization, but that is a, a start, that's by 2050s. Uh, but, it's not, but it's not only also the reduction in greenhouse gas emission that this greening um, of the transport network would bring. It has a benefit in terms of air quality improvement and avoiding premature death. It also improves the efficiency uh, of the transport in the logistics network and many other associated benefits that come with it. Now, but to achieve this, it's the um, price tag is huge. So the, our estimate was $41 billion uh, to actually achieve, which is interesting actually, it was the exact the same figure you cited <laughs> on what was lost in, in one uh, event. Uh, so 41 billion, but to put in a context, this was more than double that these countries have spent for the last 10 years. So what they need to spend in 10 years is on the average, is more than uh, double what they spent. So uh, countries like Ukraine, of course now Ukraine after the Russian invasion of the country, 
the needs are going to be quite significantly higher. But this was pre-war, so Georgia, all of those countries would uh, we need to invest significantly higher. So 41 billion is big ticket. They don't have the fiscal space to actually come up with it from their own. And the international uh, overseas development assistance or international financial institutions are not enough uh, by any stretch of imagination to support that level of uh, investment. So what does that leave us? Okay, governments don't have enough. Uh, aid agencies do not have enough. So basically, it's the private sector that needs to, we're looking, everybody's looking at the private sector as a way to solve this issue. But the private sector does need to be paid. So they're not there as a charity. They're not aid organization. So we have to look at the revenue streams that are going to support that. So this is where I think the innovation that comes then is, well, how can we think in terms of thinking about generating additional revenues uh, to support this kind of investment, whether it's going to be through congestion charging, uh, different carbon pricing mechanisms. Uh, for example, in the context of the IMO, there is quite a lot of discussion on market-based mechanism to actually charge uh, shipping agencies as part of decarbonizing uh, the shipping industry. So that can generate significant amount of revenue that can support that. At a local level, charging uh, road vehicles for the externalities and for the emissions and air pollution they cause is also shown to generate significant revenues that could be plowed back. Uh, many countries also use land value capture. When you are densifying cities, especially for railways, it actually improves the land value uh, around the stations and around the corridor but the land value can then be brought back through a financial mechanism to support investment uh, under railway sector or in other improvement of the system. So that's, I think, on the funding side. But then we have also on the financial structuring side that we really need to think about as well to bring uh, uh, projects that private sector can invest in. Now, many of the investments in uh, the greening aspect beyond the railway, beyond the bulky ones, they tend to be small scale and fragmented, like electrification of buses or building charging facilities. So they're not uh, on their own, they do not have a scale to actually attract uh, big institutional investors, for example. So what we have been actually looking at at the World Bank is to look into an investment platform to aggregate the demand across different countries. We're starting now to look at, especially in small economies like uh, in Africa, in Western Africa, we're looking into having a sub-regional investment platform that can uh, aggregate the needs and pull the needs and then raise the funds as a group rather than individually. So we think this could um, perhaps unlock the investment and this could also be, I think, a good model for the uh, Eastern Partnership countries or smaller countries, um, uh, others that actually need uh, to attract financing for small scale investments by this aggregation mechanism. So that's what we see and uh, hopefully this resonates well, but happy to elaborate. Thank you, thank you very much, Benjamin. That will certainly uh, come back in all this debates because Matei is also working quite a bit uh, in these type of uh, domains. And it is, of course, the key question, how are we going to do this? I think uh, this was already a very insightful uh, first round uh, with the challenges that lie ahead of us. And uh, perhaps, uh, Regina, if you allow me to come back to you, um, I have spoken also from my side on the EU's approach, the TNT, uh, on, on uh, adaptation and, and resilience. Uh, how, how do you see that and how do you think this adaptation and resilience uh, policy is robust enough and how can it be translated uh, further into other uh, areas of the world, please? Uh, thank you very much for this uh, question. That's very close to my heart. My background is law and I'm always looking out. I've been working on uh, climate change cool. issues for a long time um, and the stumbling point block is always how to, as I mentioned earlier, translate this ambition into action. And this is very interesting about the EU's approach. So what it does is it has a systemic uh, cross-cutting and integrated approach to climate proofing across policy domains and sectors. And there's a real line, as one would wish, from policy, in this case, for example, the EU adaptation strategy, 
which sets out the commitments, and then the legislation, which includes the EU climate law, which entered into force last July and is directly applicable and effective in all EU member states, and among others, includes a robust paragraph, uh, a robust article requiring uh, action on adaptation together with the monitoring and reporting mechanism. And that is then translated and that is fed into other legal instruments. The 10T regulation is an example for the trans-European network, uh, transport networks, but it's also more generally applicable in the EIA, Environmental Impacts Assessment Directive. So now it's a matter of law to carry out very considered evidence-based um, vulnerability assessments uh, for infrastructure projects, large infra infrastructure projects. Um, and uh, this is supported in addition by detailed technical guidance. So this is really to overcome this stumbling block that I had mentioned earlier. Mm. How do you get there and to make sure this is uh, happening on the ground? And for, at, at the global level, this is, I think, a very useful example to build on, mm. but it's also going to be uh, impacting others because EU funding decisions, infrastructure funding, is also going to mm. be subject to these requirements. So this is very interesting and I think a very good example of what effective policy and legislation can do. Mm. I think, thank you, Regina. I was very happy that you were uh, going in that detail. Uh, indeed, uh, the co-funding that we make available uh, from the EU side is subject to all the acquis on the environmental side, but also now with the new uh, law on the new regulation on climate proofing. Uh, uh, Matej, you were also referring to that because you are in fact not only working on the infrastructure, but as you said, also on the integration of all of this legislation into the laws of the, the, the Western Balkans. Uh, I would like to ask you uh, how you feel that you are succeeding on that and also what how do you think with your experience, in both in the EU and in the Western Balkans, can that be reproduced to other parts of the world? You are now going to do that uh, for the uh, Eastern Partnership, uh, Moldova, Ukraine and uh, Georgia. But perhaps you have also a broader view uh, from your double experience. Well, thank you very much for this question. I think the first issue is really to focus on the network. And I think that we also need in politics to have a different approach towards the network industries. What I want to say with that is that energy, transport and digital should be planned together because it makes sense. Just logically, if you see, for example, transport is already one of the biggest users of the energy. So, and now if we would like to have sustainable transport, we would like to have the charging stations along the network. That means that we need to have also the energy mm. that will support mm. clean energy for le electricity alongside the corridors, which means that transport and energy needs to work together. Digital is the future user of that, and mm. already the future of transport is very much digital. So again, the digital networks have to be planned at the same time. Now, where is that, um, what could be the lessons for the countries outside the EU is specifically to really think regionally. Because if we think regionally and plan globally, this has been perhaps an overused phrase, but it does make sense. Mm. Because the transport networks, energy networks, digital networks cannot be planned only nationally. Mm. Because we will not get the same efficiencies or the same savings, being environment, being economic, or anything else if we don't do that. So here I think that this is really the case. And perhaps I would like to just return to an issue where I think it's uh, the issue which is very much uh, in the countries outside the EU, the problem which is definitely affecting transport is the delays on the border crossings. Mm -hmm. The delays on the border crossings are taking away a lot of uh, good which has been done on the infrastructure. Because mm. we can have a beautiful rail, but if the train has to stop for one day or for seven hours or trucks and so on, then all these savings go uh, outside and not only the environmental savings, yeah, because you. you also need, of course, more trucks in order to do the same type of business. So that's a little bit of this. Mm. Just a little question now still, uh, Matej. Um, do you think that it, there should be something like, for instance, a Tenti also in, in Africa or in South America uh, of a similar nature? Do you think that this is possible? 
or should it be globally wide, uh, global wide? Sorry. Well, I think that the regional approach is definitely the only approach, but the regional approach needs to connect to the other regions of the world. So okay. here, I think that there is already in energy as well as in transport, there are plans to connect with North Africa, mm -hmm. and that makes sense. Mm -hmm. We also need, for example, you could see the energy network mm -hmm. that could be from the solar in the North Africa mm -hmm. to the you know, biofuels to everything else in one network. The same should happen in transport. The same is happening in digital. Yeah. So definitely the answer is yes. Yes. I mean, that's, that's very nice. It, is, it was also reflecting also, there was a session today uh, where the Egyptian minister was talking and he was also referring to the African cooperation, uh, how this could be shaping up and uh, bringing it together, Nile River, which is the same like Rhine River and so on, uh, short sea shipping, uh, cross-border rail and road connectivity. So I'm happy that you're referring to that. I remember that we were working also as the EU together with South America for a certain time to try to set up such a 10T approach in South America. Uh, I, I come back a little bit later still, but uh, Binyam, you were talking about your experience also with the Eastern Partnership. Uh, did you also come to these aspects that uh, Matei was referring to, like the cross-border cooperation? I, I start with that question first and come back to the financial instruments later. Just first on, on the, this regional cooperation and how this functions with your financial instruments approach. Yeah, I, I think uh, regional cooperation and border crossing rules are essential. I mean, you can build all the infrastructure you need, but if there are bottlenecks at the border, if there is no border facilitation, and agreements on uh, on how transport is going to govern, uh, yeah, we're not going to reach anywhere uh, that we want to. So it was the Eastern Partnership clearly. That's why I think the TNT gives you a very good uh, framework and uh, approach, uh, not only for solving your transport needs within a country, but also how you can cooperate across countries. So indeed, uh, that is, I, I also really like the focus on the regional approach mm. that Matthias is saying, um, because many countries are just too small to be uh, attractive for investment or to stand on their own. Uh, they do need to trade among each other. You need to facilitate uh, the logistics system among the uh, different countries and also to have an investment uh, uh, program that is big enough that can attract uh, all that you need. Mm. So for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Regina, following on what uh, Benjamin was just saying, um, one, of the, one of the bottlenecks may be uh, also this, this funding site and, uh, and perhaps not only the funding and whether it's financial or grants, but also the capacity of, of the countries to turn it around. So let's say also the technical assistance side. How, how you see that? Because you're also from your UNCTAD side, I would be very happy if you can shed a light on that. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, we've, we've done some work in this respect, but I think it's really important to, uh, when people hear funding and costs, you know, everybody's sort of taking a step back and say, oh, somebody wants something from me. And there has been a lot of talk at this COP about loss and damage. Well, we have to bear in mind that adaptation and resilience building, the whole point is to avoid loss and damage. That's the whole point. And to, uh, of course, maintain, for the countries concerned, sustainable development prospects and gains. So what is needed? Technical capacity building. That's human capacity building, but also technology and finance, and we need a lot more of that. That's just the reality. And this has to be from the developing country's perspective, not only in the form of loans, but also grants, because otherwise loans increase the debt burdens further. And in addition, you need uh, funding for the relatively modest costs involved in facility level uh, risk and vulnerability assessments. We've done something like this in the past, but follow-up funding isn't that easily available. Mm. So my general message on this would just be for everybody here, we mustn't forget, we're, re we're literally here all in the same uh, boat, and there is, there is no them in us. So it's, it's, it's time to get uh, active. And if we just look at what happened in Pakistan this year, and I think the World Bank estimated, what was it, 36 billion is going to be the minimum required for uh, reconstruction. We want to avoid things like that. And this is why adaptation, resilience building for critical infrastructure, including transport infrastructure, is mm. so very important. And we really have no time 
to lose. Thank you. Thank you, Regina. Uh, this, a little bit same question to you as well, Matei, uh, following up what, from what Benjamin said. You, you, you are familiar with the working with this blending between a grant component and innovative financial instruments, uh, the WBIF, for instance. Uh, how do you see that uh, functioning in the Western Balkans? And uh, do you think that this uh, is successful? Can we also replicate that uh, to other uh, parts of the world? I think that, uh, of course, the funding is crucial here. But I think that also, at the same time, we need to have our priorities straight. And the priorities, when it comes to sustainability, also needs to show uh, with the financing. Um, look, and here, I mean, there are certain projects which can be financed through the private investors or with, a, with but there will be certain projects, for example, the rail is a good example, there, there is a need for substantial support from the government. And that is something in the shape of grants even, mm -hmm. because this is something that is absolutely necessary. So I think that, yes, we can do a lot with blending, we can do a lot with different also PPPs and so on, mm -hmm. but not for everything. Mm -hmm. So we need to be also honest and clear that also if we want to achieve sustainability when it comes to a transport sector, also there will be a very much need of a direct financial support from the government. Yeah. And, and Matej, you are in fact doing, in your function, you are directly doing also what Regina was referring to like this technical assistance you with your secretariat you are giving that to the six western balkans yes indeed i mean the, um, the here i think the approach when we're also talking to the rest of the world is really there has to be a political support but sustainable political support yeah, yeah. you know uh, just uh, look what happened after covid and the cities and cycling mm. you know in the you know when the covid happened and the transport was I mean, public transport uh, was affected a lot of cities went in cycling and that was great and everybody thought oh this will be a great revolution and so on and everything will change well it did change in the cities where the governments followed with the substantial changes on the ground, making new cycling lanes, improving the f facilities and so on. Where this was not done, situation went back to the business as usual. Mm. So if there is no substantial and sustained political support, we will not see sustainability. A lot of S's in one sentence. <laughs> <laughs> but indeed you are uh, confirming what Regine also said and, and you're making the point it has to be sustained. Uh, so this technical assistance is not something that is just a some that you allocate it is building also the capacity in the, in the country is concerned that's what i i keep from you regina what you're saying that's correct i mean yeah yeah you can come in it, I mean, it is i know time is an issue here but oh, okay. abso absolutely and we discussed a little bit earlier for example sometimes maintenance is a is an issue so you get the funding for a project but you don't get money to to keep it maintained or for monitoring uh, which is very important and i have already mentioned uh, risk and vulnerability assessment. So this is really something where, where ma major upscaling is, is needed. Yes. William, to com come back to you, uh, you have been working, uh, we had the example of the Eastern Partnership, uh, but now looking also what uh, has been said by Regina uh, here on the technical assistance, uh, how do you see your successfulness in this blended instruments? And, and do you think that this is uh, sustainable <laughs> in a way of financing? <laughs> No, because, they, because, sorry, they, they really referred also to a grant component being necessary in certain fields or in certain parts. How do you see that from, from your experience? Sure. I mean, uh, indeed, I mean, you know, blended finance, grant financing is, will be needed and is needed. Uh, I mean, during this COP, we just heard now Indonesia has this big uh, uh, funding, $20 billion to support its transition out of coal. Last year, last in, at Glasgow, South Africa also uh, got like $8.5 billion for transition out of coal. So it's there, uh, but we have to recognize that um, those are very few. They are not much, uh, but we do need um, uh, to attract them. And the way to attract them, I believe, is to first of all, uh, first uh, find bankable projects. Even the grant people who give you grant, they also want to see that their grant is being spent on a highly relevant project that actually uh, has a, a return that they expect. In this case, would be a significant reduction in greenhouse gas emission. And also that has core benefits in economic development and other things. Uh, within the bank, we have just recently 
launched what we call the Global Facility to Decarbonize Transport. This is a multi-donor uh, facility trust fund to provide grant to, for technical assistance, basically, to, with the specific idea of developing uh, bankable projects or investable projects, if you will. So this kind of, I think, instruments are key as a starting point. And then you have to wrap this with the uh, policy support that is needed to make sure that these projects will be valuable, uh, uh, credible, uh, as well as also to get um, domestic financing raised domestically. I think it's important to, a lot of people, they don't pay what should cost. So we really also users would need to contribute into this infrastructure through different user mechanism. So governments often are reluctant to do that, but if uh, they are showing the trade-offs mm. between borrowing or not doing mm. to get the users to pay for this infrastructure is needed. So working on the revenue side, on the user side, uh, getting grants, getting private sector investment, all of that, I think it's a kind of an uh, all of the above Mm. strategy that you have when it comes to financing. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you. Uh, it, it shows, in fact, that it is a complex whole of different funding and financing sources, but also, again, you were, in fact, you are nicely referring back also to what Matei said. In the end, it's also the policies that go with it. You cannot simply pour the money and then there will be no uh, reform in the end. There will be no, let's say, cross-funding between different transport modes, uh, tolling, and so forth. And uh, there is nothing such as a free lunch, but there is also nothing such as free public transport or free co construction of infrastructure. Uh, I'm turning also to the room because we had also foreseen that we would have a debate with the audience uh, here and uh, online. And online, uh, I have also seen quite a few slide questions, which are, are quite nice. Uh, I, I would be happy to uh, see uh, perhaps uh, Regina this first question that you see on the, on the screen here, how can the TNT help in third countries reduce emissions? Uh, would you feel uh, you could uh, shed a light on that one? I, uh, you know, to be honest, I'd rather not... There's, there's uh, three people here talking about emissions. I'm here the champion for resilience and adaptation. <laughs> so give me another question. I will give please. you another question. Uh, but then I to first turn to... Uh, Mat 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 yeah, perhaps? Okay, Matei, please. Well, you know, I will say something a bit... Um, I, I don't think that 10T can help third countries to reduce emissions. I think only um, the countries outside the EU, by their own uh, willingness, and then looking at the experience of 10T, which is unique. Huh? 10T is a trans-European network. If we would really like to have a trans-African network, trans-Asian network, trans-South Asian network, we, they will need to do this by themselves. And of course, the 10T uh, can be a great example, and I'm sure that um, the Europeans would love to share their experience. However, the, the need for that, and also the political understanding and buy-in, needs to be local as well as the knowledge. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, it's not sustainable. If there is somebody else coming and saying, this should be done this way, and that should be done the other way, without that to be internalized, and being really felt as a priority also, somewhere else, then it's just uh, not sustainable. So it's extremely important. Look, for example, in 10T, the key of 10T is that there is an agreement between governments in a long run. So that basically the 10T regulation does not change. When was the last revision of the 10T? It was five, seven years ago. So the point is that no matter what kind of governments there are in power, the basic premises of the 10T and the network corridors will not change. And for that, it's so important to have this political buy-in. So that's why I think Tenti uh, can help as an example, but I think that the knowledge the, uh, and, uh, is, as well as the expertise and everything else will have to come from uh, locally. Th thank you very much, uh, Matei, for putting that so clearly, and uh, you have the experience from the two sides, so <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, the question here uh, is also, what are the main challenges for the completion of the network? And it's very close to what you were saying, uh, of course, it is uh, very much a cooperation between member states, which needs to be uh, very clearly framed. Uh, what I myself see as an experience uh, since many years now is that uh, we are still struggling, you put that point forward as well, Matei, on the cross-border in particular. How do member states figure 
out these policies together and thereby become more resilient. It is, uh, it is very, uh, let's say, difficult to get there. Uh, I think the main challenges will be uh, this engagement, but also the uh, funding and financing side to it. Uh, how can we turn around this very complex uh, network into a successful high standard network on the long run? And uh, it is not uh, going to be easy to be successful there. There's a question there, and I, I come to you, uh, Binyam, uh, also here in, in, uh, from one uh, anonymous speaker. You mentioned the importance of private investment in creating uh, green and resilient infrastructure. Could you provide some examples uh, from your experience where the investment was effectively incentivized and, uh, and channeled? Yeah, um, so I think that's uh, actually a very good question. So, to be honest, most of the private investment or climate investment, related climate investment, has been until now primarily in the energy sector. So you will see quite a lot of the climate finance or private finance related to climate going to energy because they have been at this business for much longer than the transport business. So they have, you know, uh, instruments like to invest on so solar, wind, and other renewable energy. In the transport sector, uh, investments uh, have happened uh, in a much more smaller scale, but more like on uh, electrification of buses, charging facilities. I think China is a good uh, example here where they have, uh, let's say, Shenzhen uh, municipality uh, in, in, in the southern part of China, where they actually electrified all the buses uh, and uh, taxi fleets in the city. And that was done in partnership with the private sector, where the private sector developed a business model to uh, build the charging facilities and supply the investment. So when we talk about private investment here, we should also be clear, it's really public-private partnership. It's not just solely private, because in the transport business, there is a much stronger input from the public sector is needed unlike, again, uh, the energy sector. Now, India is also trying to replicate uh, what, was, what happened in China for electrification of buses, and uh, uh, so they are getting there as well. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, a question came also in now for you, Regina. So uh, somebody is completely agreeing with your message on uh, the time to act on adaptation, which is now. How, in your view, can this message be most effectively transmitted to policymakers to make sure that it is taken into account at every level? That's a very good question, and thank you very much whoever uh, wrote this question. First of all, I think it's important to consider climate, physical climate risks to transport and other critical infrastructures as a business risk, not an environmental issue, because that engages different people. Um, and we, instead of focusing on the cost of adaptation, we have to focus on the cost of inaction. I mean, the, the numbers are, are enormous. It just doesn't bear thinking about. And we know that 1.5 degrees is the sort of level at which the community has agreed with scientific information available that this is manageable uh, levels of global warming. And we are really on track of overshooting this. So definitely we do have to adapt uh, and on the on the on the on the finance side because I can hear the discussion again it's about uh, what did you say blended that's a nice word blended finance when I'm talking about the need for grant finance in infrastructure adaptation this is in large part a matter of survival and and we've looked at this actually in a policy brief recently and you know in 2019 do you know how much public sector funding went into adaptation not for transport just into adaptation project, according to the OECD, 20 billion. That's a trifle. I mean, the, with the numbers that we are all have become accustomed to, to exchanging on for all sorts of purposes. So I, all I can say is really it's all hands on deck, and one would hope that the message gets through. And the one last, last point, because we are here at the 10T event, what the EU has done, I mentioned this earlier, is really very, uh, very interesting because it is so... Uh, coherent. It starts with policy, with outlines commitments, and then it helps implement this on the ground. So I very much hope that others in other region and national policymakers elsewhere will have a close look at that and see where this could be rec replicated or which aspects of this. Yes. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Regina. 
Uh, there's also a question, uh, Matej, on what can we learn uh, from the uh, Western Balkans uh, when it comes to the 10 T. So it's turning it around. Yeah. But perhaps you can also fill in a little bit on what Regina was just saying. Like how, yeah, please. Um, well, that's a good question. And I think that um, that question actually to turn it around a little bit, um, it, most of the Western Balkans was part of Yugoslavia, where there were rail networks which which functioned very well, mm -hmm. where the borders were more or less on the paper and the border crossings actually functioned also much more efficient. Mm -hmm. Now we are trying basically in a lot of ways to actually fix what was one time already uh, solved. Mm -hmm. So we should not sometimes forget that history is a good, um, a good teacher. Huh? So here I think that that is really like the, 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 the point of this is sometimes we are going back to the future. Huh? Uh, at the same time, uh, the financing and everything connected to it is crucial and I could not more uh, agree more. Maintenance should become a sexy word. It is not a sexy word because uh, usually the politicians don't go for the opening of the maintenance. You know, maintenance is something that you do every day, where the road you open once every five years. Huh? Mm. So, but we need to make maintenance sexy. I think I just made a tweet, uh, but uh, I think that that really, you know, maintenance here is the key both in the terms of sustainability, both in the terms of environmental impacts of that, and of course, both in the terms of how much money it saves if it's done uh, in a way. And there, I think we need to find a better way of actually when the projects are proposed, that the maintenance is already both included, included. not only for the first two, two years, but for 10 years and so on. Yes, it might make the project a bit more expensive, but it will make it much cheaper than the new project in five years when the road, rail or whatever falls apart. No, no, th thank, thank you, Matei, for that. And I, I think also, Regina, uh, what we can still do even beyond what we have been doing in the, in the solid framework that we have is when we are working on such projects which are very instrumental for this, let's say, network to, be, to really go into the depth also of what can be done for climate adaptation and resilience, what can be done for, for instance, this maintenance. You can include, of course, in the contracts, Binyam, I think as well, for instance, the first, uh, let's say, big maintenance after 25 years in a PPP construct, very often this is done. But you wanted to, to come in as well? well I I was just going to say that, but anyway, I also fully agree with you, Regina, uh, the need for maintenance. Perhaps this goes back to the policymakers. We talked a lot how we can get financing from private sector, from grant, but if they actually prioritize uh, their even investment, they can also improve the allocation of their uh, uh, funding. So the efficiency of their uh, investment it's also something that we have to look at. Yes, it's not sexy, yeah, uh, uh, but uh, if they prioritize it, even when they do construction, to make sure that, uh, that um, resilience and safety aspects are included. But uh, again, the innovation here would be to include the private sector to pre-finance it, uh, get the work done and maintain it over a long period of time, and then get, get paid through different uh, mechanisms. Mm. And all these innovations actually already exist mm. and uh, it has been tried uh, in many countries, India and other places as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I still look in the room whether somebody who would like to urgently jump. Yes, there is. I don't know whether there's a microphone. Yeah, there is. This microphone is coming. Thanks very much. Uh, so I'm Jill Warren from the European Cyclist Federation. I would just like to ask whether in the context of maintenance or in planning the project in the first place, do you see a greater role for active mobility within these very large infrastructure projects? And uh, how, does the, how do you see the financing and everything working for that? Thank you. Hmm. Nice one. Uh, Benjamin, you want to come in or? The microphone, microphone, okay. <laughs> okay, well, I'm happy to come in. Um, please, please, please. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I think that's key. Um, as part of resilience or part of mitigation, uh, we do need to include uh, dedicated infrastructure uh, uh, along the corridor, especially in an urban setting. Increasingly, we're thinking more about what we call the complete street network, where you're building the street mm. not just for cars, but also for uh, pe people to use it for cycling and walk walking. Mm. Uh, so that has to be done. Now, how do you finance this? 
In my view, I think it has to be included as part of the infrastructure. It cannot be, you can't go and get financing or project just for a bike lane. I think that's not uh, a, a, um, a, you know, a, a good proposition. Unless it's, uh, you can develop it at a municipality, big network of uh, bike lanes, then that could be attractive. Hmm. Uh, Matei, Matei, you wanted to comment that, yeah? Um, I think it's an excellent question because the cycling, unfortunately, for a very long time was an afterthought when it comes to transport planning. And I think that needs to change because, again, we all know the facts and the Cycling Federation always provides us with the facts of how revolutionary is cycling both as an effect on you know, well-being but also economy and everything else. And I think it has to also become not only as an afterthought but it should be the first thought and part of the, you know, this larger mix that we are talking about, road, rail, inland waterways, and so on. I think cycling should be a part. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're at the end of the one hour. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, let me try to conclude. I thought, th thought it was a really nice debate. Uh, we are on Solutions Day. And uh, on this Solutions Day, we have at least found amongst us that uh, 10T is a very strong instrument, can be combined very nicely with funding and financing can be and has to be uh, looking very deeply into adaptation and resilience. And uh, a solution could be that we, I uh, think, have been debating here that this would be multiplicated into other continents uh, across the world. But in a very prudent way, they should come bottom up as well as we have been doing also over the past years. Uh, before uh, really closing, uh, is there one thing that you would like to say, like a one-liner or a one takeaway uh, for each of you that you would have here uh, after this one hour? I don't know who would like to start with the uh, one-liner or one takeaway, main takeaway on this solution day here in Sharm el Sheikh, COP27. Regina. I would just say, really, we've got to get starting to get serious here. That's what I would say, because we've been at this for a long time and there's a lot of talk. And we really, I, we, this is even a slogan now, the time for actions now, but it really is. And we just had a question about cycling. There's so many different aspects. But uh, what I've been talking about is global freight transport. And that is not sexy at all, but it does. It's okay. what everybody depends on. We've just been through COVID and the experience with the supply chain disruptions and what this has entailed. So just extrapolate and think what may be in store under a warming climate. Thank you very much. Thank you, Regina. Benjamin. Well, we need a collaboration among different stakeholders to get this thing done. We have to bring in private sector, uh, philanthropies for the grant element, financial institutions, and the users themselves. They have to pay for what they're costing the climate as well. Thank you, Matei. I would just say that I believe that uh, the key to sustainable transport is systematic networks. Systemic and systematic. Thank you very much. And for my side, I just want an applause for the excellent uh, panel that I had. Thank you.